somehow sniff the traffic <laughs> going from the armband it's got to be talking to an api or something. <laughs> to the next cocktail to the next conversation what's up c3 squad welcome back to the c3 podcast now known as cocktails culture and conversation y'all know what it is it's your boy david lee back your, your favorite hosts your uncles aunties cousins baby mama's sneaky links favorite host david lee and of course see don't let David get away with that now. For the last for the last month, David has been promising a, a special third new fresh host, and yes. then he's going to come on and introduce himself as the favorite host. First of all, shout us out in the comments. Let them know that Main T is your favorite host. Man, please, please. First of all, <laughs> just you you're, you're the genius. junior host, <laughs> but you're not the favorite. Host. Yeah, okay. So all right, see through Scott. Y'all, let us know who your favorite host is once you meet. The special third host. But I mean, I already know y'all gonna rock with your boy. You know what I'm saying? Season four, we've been doing it. Got y'all. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see how they feel about it once we introduce the infamous third host. Look, so we've been hitting at this. We've been dropping at this. She was supposed to be there in Greensboro, but COVID is real. So she wasn't able to make it. Very real. So we we carried on with our without her with heavy hearts. We was trying to figure out what we was going to do. And we managed to do it because it's me and May. But now she is here. Without further ado. We are excited here at the C3 Podcast and Ebony Sense to introduce you to our third host of the C3 Podcast, Miss Laurel Berryman, a.k.a. L Boogie One Time. L Boogie <laughs> One Time. She never did say that she did. Oh, my goodness. She's she sure didn't. She's going to tell, she, she tell me one time live on the podcast. and be like, oh, okay. My Welcome to the podcast, Laurel. Thanks, y'all. It's good to be here. I'm super excited about this topic today. So I know it took some time and COVID and whatever, but I'm good now. So y'all ready to get into it? Let's do it. Let's get into right. it. So we're going to discuss the U.S. Constitution today. What can y'all remember when you first learned about the U.S. Constitution? For me, I think I was in third or fourth grade and we used to have to recite it that we the people in order to at the beginning of every history lesson. And I never gave it much thought, right? We're not really taught to think critically, especially in American schools, but that's another concept for another episode. Anyway, when was when was your first recollection of the U.S. Constitution? What were your thoughts about it, if you had any? Y'all are old, so you got, yeah, okay. You know what? Just, don't don't <laughs> be kicked go. off on your first show. Like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> I'm just that. being real. I mean, the infamous, you know, third host, I got to come in like I've been here, so... Take your time. Go ahead. Don't she, don't throw. Don't get distracted, she, David. She's coming for the for the poll right now. She's coming to get the number one spot immediately. Why? Just see what she's doing to your boy. It's I don't remember. I don't remember the grade, and it's because I didn't. I took so starting in fourth grade, I was in gate classes in California. So that's gifted and talented, or whatever the hell it's for, and so. I had like two sets of classes. Like I had like the those classes and then we would have like two hours every day in those in like the gate classes. And I know it was there that I learned about the constitution. Like in the regular classes, we just said, oh, it's this thing, right? But in gate class, because we had to study for academic decathlons is when we had to break everything down, right? What the preamble was and what it was and who signed it and all this stuff and what it led to. So it's to me, I'm going to say it was around... I feel like it was fourth grade, but you know, to Laurel's point, for me it was a long it was a long time ago. So like all that kind of all the gate <laughs> classes from like third to sixth grade just kind of all blending together. So somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah, for me, I, I see. I can't remember back to third, fourth, fifth grade. I, I don't think that we were at that level when I was in elementary school. So I'm thinking it was around sixth grade when I really kind of understood what the constitution was and what the specifically the bill of rights and then like the a couple of the amendments to the constitution basically ending slavery women's suffrage those are like the two big key amendments to the constitution but i think i was in middle school so maybe sixth or seventh grade when it when it first hit home for me 
did you ever think critically about, I mean, I know, and in, in we can get in more into this topic in the future when we discuss critical race theory, as I stated before, right, we're not really taught to think critically. So you just kind of read it because your teacher says that, that at the beginning of the class, this is what we're going to say, similarly to the Pledge of Allegiance. We're just going to say it and it just becomes routine and you just do it, not really realizing the harm that you're causing to yourself if you were to actually realize what that document means and how it affects you and how it affected how it affects people that look like you from the time of its inception in the 1776 constitutional convention whenever mm -hmm. right so what, what are your thoughts on that i know for me i mean i only started thinking about it more recently right like undergrad when i was studying women's studies is really when i started to question those things a lot more from that black feminist perspective that i use on everything it's kind of annoying sometimes it ruins a lot of stuff for me i don't get to enjoy life that much here <laughs> it sucks in america but anyway what, what do you think so for me, um, for, for those who've been following the network, following the podcast, they know that I'm a, a, a military, active army military vet. Um, and one thing, the first thing that you do as a service member is you raise your hand, you swear, you vow to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Maybe a year into being a service member was when I started to critically think about what does it actually mean to support and defend this document from the 1700s? Um, like when, when I am ordered to go fight a battle in some foreign country in support and defense of the constitution, exactly what is that meaning and what am I doing? And so it was about a year because after I joined, about a year after I joined is when I first deployed to Iraq um, in 2003. And that's when it started to like sink in, like, okay, like, what am I really doing here? Um, and, and how is this in support of the constitution? <clears throat> um, <laughs> so for me, it was. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I like that. <laughs> for me, it was different because like I said, so studying for a lot of these academic decathlons, like we had to dig into a lot of things and that, this was around the same time for me when I was reading a lot about, so I would always dig into the black history rights because I hated the fact that I felt like I, I never got enough in black history month and we would talk about the same stuff over and over again. So what I loved about my classes for gay classes in California was like, I had the opportunity to just kind of go and study the things that I wanted to. And honestly, it was, it's, it's interesting now if I, if I really think back about it, it kind of set me up for, for like college and be able to do research and essays. Cause we just kind of had like, Hey, what do you want to go study? And like, you go find something, you go read it. And like, I had to do like these in-depth reports and things like that. So at the time I would always, I didn't quite dig into like all of the things in the constitution, but the things that stuck out to me were obviously the, the, the civil rights and the rights that, you know, black people have or didn't have. And, and then talking about like the amendments and amendments in there. And it was at the same time that I read the autobiography, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley, which, you know, was <laughs> um, probably sacrilegious to say for those holy people, but that, that was like my Bible as a kid. Like, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I read that book. I loved everything about it and just, you know, leaning in and understanding about this man's life. And then to be in, to then have discussions about the constitution. I was like, so wait, you're telling me like the, the biggest thing I remember sticking out to me then was like the time frame, right? Time started to actually matter. Like, okay, so we're talking about something that we made amendments in like 1800s and 1900s, but this thing was wrote in the 1700s. And I was like, so when they wrote this, we were poverty. Like, so like, how do you, you know what I mean? Like, how do you reconcile with, with that? Like, here's this document that we keep amending. And, and the argument at the time was, oh, well, you know, it's like a living document. You make amendments and we change it and stuff like that or whatever. And I was like, okay, kind of sure. Like, it's good that we can kind of make those amendments. And I remember the, the biggest discussions we had was just about that, like how we make amendments and change it and make sure that it continues to be this contract that we use to define, you know, America. And I'm like, all right, cool. Again, I'm a kid. So I'm like, sure, whatever. Looking back on that now, though, it, 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 it especially you start to, to wonder like, okay, something that we wrote in the 1700s when the, the world that we knew of as far as America was just drastically different than what it is now. Like, how is it, how, how are we still governed by this? And I don't mean like it should just be like completely like ripped up and thrown away, but how have we made 
adjustments to understand like the time difference between then and now and, and to do those things. And so I, I probably wouldn't, that for me didn't really come up till honestly when I was working, cause I left out of college and I went to start working for the federal government on the other side of, of Maine, right? Maine was in the military and I was like, I ain't calling nobody, sorry, I ain't cutting nobody here. Like I'm good. So, but I'll go support this way. And so it was then that I started to see a lot of things in support of like, you know, the war efforts and, and the, the, the contracts that I was working on and stuff like that, that kind of similar to Maine, I started to kind of have the questions like, are we, are we the good guys here? <laughs> like, it was just kind of like, is this like, what exactly are we, are we doing? Right. And that is probably the last time I've really sat down and just had a real hard look at where we are as a society and where, you know, the constitution, the declaration of independence, all that stuff kind of stands kind of to where we are now. Part of the reason why I don't work for the government anymore anyway, but. <laughs> oh man, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to not work for the government anymore. I'm, I'm so close, so close to those benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And 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 um, and here and here's the thing. America's really not all that different than it was in the 1700s. Right. And I mean, people can make arguments, but I, I would always disagree with that for the people that say that it's vastly different. It's not all that different. Right. Chattel slavery doesn't exist anymore. They turned it into the prison system. Right. So people legally under the law are slaves if they are in prison. So there's that women's rights are being stripped from them. And at the very base level of all of it, that is the same from then versus now. We still have rich white guys making laws and setting precedents for people who do not resemble them and controlling the way that this country functions based off of their own sphere of experience and influence that has nothing to do with people of color, with women of color, black women, trans people, the, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? And so when I think about it, and you mentioned, Maine, you mentioned a couple of times the Bill of Rights, the constitution was so broken upon release that the, that's, that's what the Bill of Rights was essentially for, right? Was to correct this document that was so problematic. Then when the Bill of Rights wasn't getting it right, we fought a civil war. <laughs> like we literally went to war with ourselves over this document. And even then black people who were then freed right after the civil war, arguably freed, still didn't have anything to say when it came to the reconstruction amendments that you mentioned me, right? The 13th, 14th and 15th amendments still had nothing to say. So how is that different than what's going on now? Of course, uh, right, the founding fathers had no concept of DEI at all. And that's a little, it's a lot different now, right? There's a lot more representation and people in government that have a say that represent different minority communities and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, the majority has been, and if we keep going the way that we're going, always will be, cisgender heterosexual white men so yeah here's where i disagree it, the world is drastically different right you, you can't you can't overlook the difference between the 1700s and now like the things that you mentioned are definitely still similar to the same but global economies are completely different right the way uh, infrastructure is completely different technology is, is completely different and why these things matter is because these are things that drive uh, economy. And if you go back to the 1700s, the economy was based off farming and land. And they were coming from the system that all they knew, which was over in England, right, was a, you know, uh, the word keeps escaping me, um, but a a different system of, you know, mostly farmers, Common. commonwealth type of system providing there. And there was really no other infrastructure to provide those things. And so everything that the, the the four founders knew of was for that. And yes, you're right. The constitution was broken. Like if you go back um, now, it's it's entertainment, but there's a lot of history involved. If you go actually watch Alexander Hamilton, like it, it talks about a lot of the things you look at the Federalist Papers, like all of that, when they were trying to figure out and defend this constitution, a lot of people didn't like it because they knew that it wasn't all together. It wasn't right. There was other things that needed to be done, but this was a this was a country that needed to be founded and have like some type of laws based on what they had there. So if I look at it now, like I would say that the, the biggest difference is the way that we move in as a economy, the access to information, the access to, you know, equitable information is so completely different. You had a time then where it was like these people that were writing it, like to be educated was like a huge that that wasn't like a common thing. Right. That was something that was only given to a certain status. You look at this now, like 
Now you can, we can quibble about like the quality of education, but what I'm talking about, everybody has access to an education, right? Everybody's got access to, to Google and the internet, the, the ability to get information and, and learn about what's going on completely different than what we had back in the 1700s. And so that's why I'm like, there's, there is a lot that has changed in, in society. And, but based on that, right. The systems that have been set in place, the financial structure that's set in place now, which didn't exist when they created this, like there's a lot of things that are different, you know, between now and then. Now to look at it and go, well, you still have, you know, you know, cis white males kind of, you know, making the rules. You still have some of the same, you know, people being left out. Yeah, true, you do, but the world is still like completely different, right? So there, there, there is a, there is a, there at least, there's at least a path to where there wasn't any completely in the 1700s at all. Right. So that that to me can't really be overlooked. Well, uh, uh, the world is vastly different. Yes. And I agree with you on that. Right. Like, as you stated, right, access to opportunity, the economy, so on and so forth, where we compete on a global stage, completely different and in a lot of ways, much, much better. Yes, absolutely. But it's the same in the fact that the the main rule of law in the United States presently is still the same one that was written when African-American people were not considered African-Americans. They were not considered people at all, right? So by design, because this constitution by design was created to erect and maintain a Western slave empire, if, if that is still what we're going off of, then yes, African-American people now have much more access to opportunity and so on and so forth, but there's a, there's a glass ceiling there. You can only go so far because we were always considered to be less than, we were never even considered in the first place when this document was being created. So yes, we've made pathways for ourselves as well as other minority communities and underrepresented communities. However, by design, we can only go so far. The system was created on our backs, literally. It doesn't get to function if it's not on our backs. So so that's in that's kind of my perspective when I say that not much has changed. Man, what are your thoughts? Uh, and I was gonna say to, to your point, um, the whole purpose, I don't, I don't wanna turn this into a you know red versus blue debate, but the whole purpose of conservatism is to adhere as strictly as possible to the original doctrine <laughs> of the constitution um and you know the opposition of that is progressism and so when 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 half of the country probably more than half of the country is leaning towards hey we need to progress we need to improve we need to get better we need to change things and the opposing side is saying nah i think that this document that was written back in 1776 is exactly how america needs to be today and they are actively working to roll back, roll back rights, roll back privileges, roll back ability to progress as much as they possibly can to get back to that document. I think we're in a tough, tough spot. And it, I mean, we may be on the precipice of another civil war between ourselves where we have people who just want to get better and people who think that I think it was perfect the way it was written, you know, 300 years ago. So that's kind of where I'm at, man. And, and being, <clears throat> being a service member and, you know, you know, raising my hand and taking the oath to support and defend this document that I don't completely believe is, is where it needs to be. It's kind of a tough position to be in. <clears throat> yeah, but it's, I think, I think what gets lost in the nuances, it was, it was never meant to be right. The whole purpose of it was 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 to start. Like, how do how do you start anything, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna start something, you say, well, this is you're gonna set rules. This is how we're gonna operate. This is how we're gonna do this, right? The, the purpose of this document was never. I don't think it was ever intended to last this long. To be honest, I don't think the forefathers like for 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 all the faults that you want to say they have, which you can talk about. Yeah, they were slave owners. They were this. They were that. Okay. Did who who thinks about what it's going to be like in year 20, 2400. Like, no, yeah, like, we don't, you know what I'm saying? So 350 just, years from today. They should. Right. You can't, but that, you, there's no, and the progression of time, like you cannot, you can't possibly scale to something that says, okay, I'm going to write something now that's going to have an effect like two centuries from now. Like, no, your, 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 your thought process is like, I'm going to, at minimum, you're going to think your lifetime. So at minimum, you might reach this to a century, right? But not anything beyond that. There's there's no like 
evolution in itself, the way people and societies evolved in itself, there's no possible way that you're gonna write anything today that has any that has any kind of standing impact like two centuries from now. Like people, if we wrote something today, people two centuries now be like, what the hell? How come they didn't think about like whatever, right? If if we find out that there's other life somewhere, or we <laughs> we do all the sci-fi movies and create artificial intelligence, and now all of a sudden we have like a whole nother, you know, being that's there, and it's like nothing that we could possibly imagine. They're just like, and if you think about that, now, it's like, well, that kind of sounds crazy. Well, ask somebody in seventeen hundreds that we will be able to do this: sit in front of a computer thing that connects wirelessly and sends signals, and you can gone, like right? They didn't even they didn't mm-hmm. even know electricity. So my my point being, like, what the regardless of whatever intent that they had, it was never meant to be something that lasts for four and five centuries. It was something to get at that time, what they had founded as a country started and progressed and give them some, some order, right? That, that was the intent of it. And, so, and yeah. then the systems built, the systems built after there were to judge it and push it along alongside, right? They were supposed to have a Republic, which is something that was given to the people to adjust and continue to govern that accordingly. Now, Yes. Did you start that with corrupted individuals? Well, yeah. Right. We know that now. So then it's like you're going to get the the outputs of that. But to look at the to look at the the Constitution for me and go, all right. So a bunch of white men 300 years ago sat on a roast like that. They had no clue. They had no clue what the hell the world's going to look like right now. Their whole thing. I get if my thing is they wrote this to be like, look, I'm trying to write this. So that way my children, and my grandchildren have some kind of country that they can live in. And that's it. And then after that, they'll figure out what to do with from there. And you know what, to your point, man, I, I, I think that the original intent of the constitution was to, like you said, last couple of generations, maybe three, you know, um, you know, long enough to where I, I can still possibly be alive and see a functioning society for my great grandkids, you know? Um, but we still, to this day, you know, 250, 300 years later, have a segment of society that is actively fighting <laughs> to to per, to stifle progress and to keep things as you know as strictly adherent to the original document. And I think that's where I have an issue um, is that we have people actively fighting to stifle progress. Yeah, and that's I think that's where. Therein lies the problem, right? So you have a set of individuals that had a set of beliefs. And so they write this document and say, here's our beliefs. Their beliefs about women, their, their beliefs about, you know, black people, all their beliefs, whatever. So they write down this document and says, what are we going to do? Cool. So then their sons and their grandsons and their granddaughters, right? That, did, that then becomes their legacy, like their heritage, right? So they're going to say, yeah, like, well, you know, grandpa... Wrote the, wrote the so yeah we should we should absolutely do this right and then generation three and four and five and six and seven the the corruption continues to go down the line right until finally like we start to say okay maybe this isn't right and we start to kind of try and make a process to go and an amendment and do different things I think that I, I I look at it as my fault and less in a three hundred year old document and more in the process around it, right? And and would have what are we doing for the process that was built around the constitution that then systemically was created to kind of protect the same flawed mentality that was in there. But the way the system was written was written to govern and change. So if we go back to the four founders, right? They they left a country where the whole reason why they came here and they wanted their independence was because they didn't want to be, they didn't want to report to a monarchy. They didn't want somebody telling them exactly how and when they can do something. So they created a system in which that by by default, it could change itself, right? So that was created within within this, the system that we have. So it's, it's there, is it fair? No, but the, the system is there to to correct itself and to change itself. It was, they they kind of built in the need to have a, a revolution or a rebellion every so often to make sure that they did not create another longstanding monarchy like what they left from. 
it just to me it sounds like you're it sounds like you're almost being an apologist for these folks and no. in, in 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 the sense that again we, and we can speculate i don't know what they had in mind i of, of, i'm going to assume that they didn't know that google was going to be a thing and tesla and whatever all these years later and they didn't plan for that and i don't give people who own other people and think that's okay much credit anyway so okay yes they didn't know any better there's one thing but we can't write off the fact of the we, it's a document, but again, this is the rule of law in the country. So it's not it's not just a piece of paper. This is the this is how systemic racism and oppression continues to exist down the line. And so maybe they didn't know or they assumed, oh, well, one day someone will change something. And again, like I said, James Madison with the Bill of Rights, he had a feeling and he didn't even want to write the Bill of Rights because he thought that it would be problematic. And there were people who didn't attend the Constitutional Convention and so on and so forth because they didn't want anything to do with it. But one way or the other, whether they could see into the future or not, these people knew that they themselves, as they, as long as they lived, they wanted this country to work in their favor. They were not concerned with black people because black people were not considered people at the time. They were concerned with people who looked like them and they were concerned for the future of people who looked like them. And that is really where we're at. Right. So, so first of all, I'm not, a, I'm not apologizing for them, but I'm like, what, what is, I'm, I'm accepting the reality of, of what wasn't with something that's happened in the past. Like I, we can't change anything what they did in the past the or the document. We can't we can't change it. You know, Laurel, like unless you have a time machine over there. No, 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 no. I can't go back. I can't go back, but we can change the constitution today. Okay, which is so but, but that's not what I said. What I said is you can't change the past. I didn't say anything about changing the constitution. So my point is my, my standpoint is not I'm I'm apologizing for anything they did. I'm saying you have to under I look at something as like, okay, understand what happened and and what was put in place, right? You're saying that the constitution is the reason why this happened. I disagree. It's not the Constitution. It's the system that was put in place around it. So the judicial system, the legislation system, all these things that was put in place around it. Like the, the Constitution was here are our guidelines and here's where we're going to start. And then the system we're going to put in place is is there to protect and keep the Constitution going. It's the at this point, this country doesn't even it runs off the Constitution, but it runs off the system, which then points back to the Constitution as a reference point, right? To say, okay, uh, so perfect example, like case study in law, right? If, if, if we're lawyers and we're going to go and defend something, right? We have to go do case studies and say, okay, this is what the law has done. These are the decisions that's made. And then at the end, the, the, the end reference point is the, is the Constitution. But the system itself was created to be able to change that base reference point if you have enough evidence and other things that say, yes, this is the way it should be. And then they go forth and change it again, while the Supreme Court justice exists. So my point is the system that was created, that was what was given. And that's what got corrupted. The constitution in itself was a document, a bunch of ignorant white people 300 years ago who wrote something down, who yes, wanted to keep everything that they had going. Right. So I'm not apologizing for them. I'm just saying like, okay, that's what they did. It's the system that was then created that's right. keeping everything else going. So like- well, The system was created after the constitution was formed. That's my point. So if you have a system that's being based off of this document that these rich white slave owners wrote, that's the issue. So the system is based on this racist document. Here we are. Right. But that, that's, that's my point. This, you, you, it sounded like you're saying the system came before and there was already a problematic system and the constitution came in. No, the constitution was put in place first and then the system was constructed. I mean, arguably, of course, there was other things in place. There was slavery, all that stuff. So these systems of oppression were there, yes. But the constitution came in and said, now we're going to make it law. And it's going to last. So, no, what, what I was going back is is... is if you if you want to know how something got to be, you have to know the lineage of where it kind of came from and how it started. So no, the systems the systems didn't start until they built the constitution. Those are the instructions. And I'm saying that the if you go back and under and look at why they created the constitution, why the forefathers even came or whatever you want to call them, even came over here in the first place, was of what they left and what they were trying to create, right? So if you if you go back and have an understanding of of how somebody works, then you then you see the logic and the things that they did. Whether or not you agree with it or not, like I'm, I'm not debating the fact that what they did was wrong. They own slave owners. It's, again, it was 300 years ago. I'm not. I'm not I'm, there's nothing I can say or, or debate that I can make that's going to change any of that. To me, it doesn't matter. What matters is 
what was done, then what systems were put in place, and how is it how has it been perpetrated? Then those are the areas where we have we have ways to say, okay, well, we can make change because they literally created a system to change itself. That's my whole point, right? The Constitution is meaningless because they created a system where they can say, okay, look, we're going to write this Constitution, we're going to go for it there, and then if we don't like it because they did not want to turn around and create another monarchy, we're going to create a system in which it can change itself. Now, was that for our benefit? Absolutely not. They weren't thinking about us. They weren't thinking about women either. They were just thinking, I don't want to have to answer to another king or queen again. So if we want to have to rebel, which is why the, the, the second part of it is the right to bear arms, and we have to go a militia and fight against each other and break a cough again, we can do it again. They created a system to allow it to do that. That's my point. The system that they created in order to change something, in order to break away from something, that's everything that they put in place. Right. Which is why you go down to Texas all the time and they're like they feel like they're their own state and their own country and, and all this stuff, whatever, because that was all put in place. Right. This whole thing was created. So that way you have this their vision when you go back and study was to have this country that could redefine itself at any moment. Right. That they could that you, you were going to give their generations the ability to say, OK, we will create a system for you to be able to take this. If you don't like the way something is, is going in, you can then f go forth and change it now. The reason why I'm harping on that is because if you don't understand the way the system is created and you want and you want to fight against it, like you can't fight something that you don't understand. So then all you're doing is sitting here and yelling and screaming and not doing anything. And the system's still going to keep rolling. So if we don't understand what that system is and we actually want to make change, then we have to go and use the system that's that's there. Right. And then you start to break it apart and make a new one. Otherwise, you can go the anarchy route and say, well, blow everything up. OK, but that doesn't solve anything. What does well, that, what does the that system was created for white people by white people. That's my point, is that the system was not structured in a way yes, that everybody Lord, else did. Lord, yes. How? How? Yes. Tell, tell me how. Tell me how. What do you mean tell you how? Tell like, you know how. how. Tell me how the system was constructed for Black people to be successful. It wasn't. I never said okay. it was. So, that, so that's my point, David. That's what I'm trying to say, is that the people that constructed this, and you're saying that they wanted it to reinvent itself over time and their descendants, yes, their rich white descendants to reinvent it. And why would their rich white descendants do anything other than uphold whiteness? And that's what's happened. That's why Roe just got overturned. That's why the, the Voting Rights Act has been gutted. That's the reason why. It just continues down the line. Right, but you're, 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 you're combining two different things, right? Like, yes, they created a system for themselves to be able to reinvent what they wanted. Yes. But in that system, right, they gave, they gave it to the people. You can disagree with it all you want to, but if you look at it, it was given to the people to interact with it, right? So you have pathways into the system to help redefine the way it goes. Now, if you want to get back to you say, you just said, well, this is why the the <clears throat> the, the, the laws have been overchanged and things like that. You want to know why? Because people don't get involved in the actual system that's been put in place for you to actually have an effect on how it changes. People just sit back and go, well, it's corrupt and it's this whatever. So, okay, it, it and it absolutely is, but... You can see where change can happen if you get yourself into the system and understand how it works. You ain't got to like it, but that's that's what's been set up. So, yeah, I'm not saying that absolutely. When they set this up, they didn't set this up for us. They didn't set it up for you as a woman, as a black. No, they didn't. Because let's be honest, we didn't exist to them. So they set it up as a pathway to constantly change. My, my whole point is then use the pathway that they set, right, to understand how this works. And if you want to have something change, that's your agent of change because there's nothing else been set for you because you're absolutely right. They didn't think about you or me or any of our brothers and sisters or our uncles or they didn't. We were not concluded in that in any way. What they what they gave us, right, is a system to be able to change this country that they created. So use the system that's there if you want to make changes to it. Getting Looking back 300 years and saying a bunch of racists wrote a document, yeah, they did. <laughs> was... right, right. And there's no, and there's no debating that we all agree on that. But, but what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to get across is the us, is the people. What does that mean? Who were they? Who is the us? Who are the people that could one day change this document and make the country what works for them in that period of time? Because what I'm saying is, as, and as much as, again, it's really speculation because we, when we don't know exactly what they thought beyond, you know, documents and, and records that they have left us. Um, but we, I, I can assume that the people that were writing the constitution did not imagine a world where women had rights, where women would vote, where black people would be free. Absolutely not. They did not see that. So my point is when they were writing that document, if they had that change piece in mind that this will go on, 
the people that could change it, who need to change it in order for it to fit and benefit everyone equitably, it wasn't us. It was uh, it was it was cis het, maybe not cis het, we don't know about that, but white men. <laughs> Period. Not, so people who appear to be people who appear to be white. That's that's the point. White male individuals. Those are the people that they were looking for. Okay, in the future, y'all can take this and change it. They never ever, I I know, could not have imagined that we would have a black president, that we would have black people in Congress and in the Senate and mayors and, and governors and so on and so forth who could change these laws. Black people who could vote in general. Okay. So, that, so, so that's what I'm saying. So when you say, so who who is us when 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 they write we the people, and there were over four million people who were not considered people because of their race. But right, but, but what you're explaining to me is the is the their ignorance is the exact flaw that's needed to get in there. So you're right. So they said we the people, the people constituting everybody in with this at this time with this is baby America, right? And in their in, the, in their view, it's not women, it's not black people, it's it's their sons and their families. Okay, cool. That's going to be the people. Well, now we fast forward. The people is American citizens, which they didn't think would be Latinos or Asians or right. or you know transgenders or they any of that. But now they are right. So those people have those rights now within that system to go and they can go and get in politics. You can go become a congressman, you can become a senator, you can become president, you can do all, you can take part of the system that they created to keep the original document and keep the company going into a certain direction, you can become a part of that system and guide it the way you want it to do. Why? Because when they said the people, they never considered that the people would look like us. But guess what? The people now do look like us. So my whole point that I'm trying to make to you is like, yes, like they didn't, they didn't have an intention for any of us to do it. And that's their fatal flaw. Cool. I'm not gonna like. I, to me, I'm just like, great. That's what y'all did. Y'all, y'all didn't, y'all didn't even think we'd be here. Well, guess what? Now we are here. Now my thing is, instead of, I, I guess my thing is, I literally don't give a shit what's in the Constitution. I want to know what's in the system and how we can get more people educated about that system and then start changing to to be this America of what we want it to be. But it doesn't happen by people sitting on the sidelines and just. Looking at it, you have to go get involved and get into the system because that was the thing that was created, not intentionally. No, it was not created for us, but it was created to keep this society going, this American society. That's how it was meant to work, right? I always look at things. I'm an engineer at the end of the day. I look at things and break it down. Like, this is how the system was created to work. They never expected somebody. If you look at a gas tank, it's like, okay, gas is supposed to take gas. You put it in there and it goes. Nobody expects you to put bleach or ever clear in there, like, but you put Everclear in there and it'll still work, right? So they didn't expect women and black people to be able to like, no, they didn't expect Barack Obama to happen. They didn't expect AOC to happen. Never in a million years would they've ever thought about that. But now it's here and that same system is there. Right. But I, my, my bigger thing is, yes, the Constitution was a, a document written 300 years ago that had nothing to do with us and set a very bad precedent for this U.S. But my optimism in the fact that this country was created to redefine itself. And if we don't understand that and if we don't tie to that and then keep fighting for those rights to get into that system, that's the that's the way we can make it better. If we don't, which is why the civil rights movement was so important, which is why like so many things that happened was so important to get to get people to understand and get in those paths. Right. That that's the biggest thing that to me that I take away from from all of that is like like the system or not. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's not. But it's the system that we have. Like, there's, what, what's the other alternative? So start getting that system and using it and making those changes. Because if you don't, yes, the white men that are in charge will continue to be in charge, right? <clears throat> Think about it. If you let's let's go poll people and say, do you want to go get into politics? No, they want to go be an engineer. They want to be a rapper. They want to be this. They want to be that. They want to be able to, nobody. They don't want to be politicians. You know who wants to be, you want, you know who wants to be politicians? White men, because they understand like this system that was created, like. This is where the, the 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 power lies. This is where I can actually make things happen, right? It's not sexy. It's boring as hell. Turn on C-SPAN for a day, like. But that's some people find it real sexy. Say what? <laughs> so I said some people find it very sexy. Just like, okay. <laughs> Time for a quick break to talk about our cocktail of the week, the Negroni. Hey y'all, welcome back. Today's cocktail is the Negroni. The Negroni was originally inspired by the classic cocktail, the Americana. 
But someone switched up the scene when I said, hey, let's do this, but with gin. So we're going to start off with one and a half to two ounces of dry gin. Today's gin of choice is Bombay Sapphire because it's one of my favorites. And we're going to go ahead and follow that up with three quarters of an ounce of sweet vermouth. You can use whatever sweet vermouth that you want for this cocktail. And then the star ingredient of this cocktail is Capari, which is a bitter orange liqueur, a pair of teeth, if you will. And we're going to do three quarters of an ounce as well. And that is the third and final ingredient for the cocktail. We're now going to grab ice and add it to our mixing glass. We're going to do this so we can stir all three ingredients and then equally mix them and chill them at the same time. Now I'm going to grab more ice, add it to my cocktail glass, and then we're going to go ahead, grab our strainer, and pour the mixing glass contents into the actual cocktail glass, our cup that we'll be drinking out of today. This is a vibrant color complemented by the Campari and the Sweet Moon. And lastly, as a garnish, if you must have one, it is a simple orange pill. We're going to go ahead, twist the pill, get the oils, surround the glass, and cheers. I'm not one of those people. I'm not. <laughs> but the, I, mean, I mean, so there, there, I'm like, I get what you're saying. Like, there, the system exists. You have to operate within the system in order to be able to change the system. That's part of the reason why I got into the military. It's part of the reason why I got into the intelligence field because, like, I wanted to get that access to, like, the information that nobody else is getting access to. Um, so that's part of why my career is where it is right now. But there's still such a barrier to get into that system, to get involved in that system. And you know, the, the, we're, we're considered minorities for a reason, because when you look at all of America, when you look at all of the system, it's like 80% them and then like 20%, less than 20%, everybody else, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so for the everybody else to be able to get into the system and affect the changes that need to happen is such a monumental obstacle to overcome that to your point, I don't want to be in politics. I don't, you know, I'd rather be a rapper. It's easy for me to rap. I'd rather be, you know, a ball player. It's easy for me to pick up a ball. I'd rather be a software engineer. I'd rather be a soldier because that's something that I can look at, see a way in and do it. Whereas getting into politics is such a, it's such a, a hill to climb. And for, I'd say 99% of politicians, unless they have that lineage with money backing them, it's almost it's damn near impossible to get into. So, I mean, yeah, I agree. The system sucks. The document, antiquated, outdated, probably outrun its course maybe 150 years ago. You know what I mean? But in order for you to get into that system and start to make changes, it's almost impossible for one of us to get in and do that without having the right backing and having, you know, just the, the right set of circumstances that happen in your life to put you in that position. And I think that's kind of the, the, the root of what Laurel's argument is, is that the system is not meant for us. For us to get into the system, you gotta, you almost gotta be lucky to get into the system. And even when you're in the system to make changes, <laughs> to make changes to this system, that benefits like 80% of the population who are actively fighting against the changes to the system that's working for them, that's worked for them for 300 years. It's tough, man. I mean, look, yes, it, it's hard, but like what, okay. So what, but what's, so what, what's the alternative? Some people suggest having another constitutional convention and revising the document. Some people, I, I, I lean on the side of abolishing it and starting over and okay. making but black okay, people but, but and okay. indigenous people part of the conversation. But let's 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 walk through that, right? Okay, so abolish abolish the constitution and start over. How are you gonna do that? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what 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 do you, what do you mean? What's your point? So I'm just let's. Walk through it. So if we want to say we want to completely get rid of the Constitution, right? There's a couple of things that would have to happen first, I believe, before that would, we would get to that point. Yeah. Right. So if right. if <laughs> I, there's no 
I can just shortcut it. There's no getting past the system that's put in place, right? We, there is no like reset button. We can't no. like just hit something and go, we're just going to start all over. You can't like, they, we're, we're too far down the path. This country is too far down the path, right? So even if we, if, if we wanted to, if we, if we, if we, if President Biden woke up tomorrow and said, I want to get rid of the constitution, right? So let's, let's really break down and understand how it works. Number one, he can't write an executive order for that. Nope. He's got to present it to both the House of Representatives and the Senate. He's got to write up a bill and get it passed by the House of Representatives, House of Representatives and the Senate to go and say, yep, we agree with you. We want to get rid of the Constitution. And they ain't doing that. Right? Now, now let's look. Why aren't they doing that? Right? So back to Maine's earlier point, right? The whole, you know, you know, uh, progressives, conservatives, right? If you start to look at what that's been made of, so it's like they will, the House usually more progressive, especially now, because it's, it's a democratic house. They support it. They, they can get it. It's like, oh, okay, we'll pass it in the house. And then you get to the Senate, which is mostly conservative. And they're going to go, nah, we're not going to do that. So even if we, if we wanted to do that and abolish the system, so it means, okay, if we want to abolish the constitution, we got to get enough people that believe in that, in that path to get into this system so we can actually have it happen. Because the, again, the way it was set up, like not even the president can just there's only the president only really has so much power actually has really limited power right it's it's the it's the judicial system and the legislative system that has the power and the checks and balances right so so we go okay well let's let's reconstruct it let's redo other things well you can make amendments to the constitution but it's the same thing right you got to go through the same process everything leads you back to the system and the process right does that suck is that daunting yes because we all know the process is corrupted but have we actually have we seen glimpses of it that it works i'm the type of person's like you just got to show me it's possible but in human evolution we've seen that right records aren't broken until somebody does it right you look at the you look at the mile the four minute mile impossible or five minute mile whatever it was nobody could ever do it first person that did it was like okay cool it was broken again three weeks later we have to see it happen as humans to be like, it's possible. So my whole point is I look at it no matter how corrupt the system is, no matter how fucked up it is, but there is a way. Why? Because I saw Barack Obama walk across the stage and get elected as president of the United States. <laughs> what do you, what's, I mean, you, you can, okay, you can, you can, but I take offense to you making that face or because you don't know what that does to the generations behind you, know. you that can look in a book and see somebody says that person looks like me. So it is possible because up until that point, I guarantee you there's people in this country who said it would never happen, but it did. Right. And, and, I, that, and I make that face not to disrespect what President Obama represents to us, but just to, to make the point that representation is not everything. Because while we did have a first black president and Obama was, a, I enjoyed Obama as a president and, and First Lady Michelle, White supremacy didn't go nowhere. All it, of these races, well, that's my no, but that, but that's, but that's my point though. Is that the, but the system has not changed. Yes, we have more representation. Yes, we had a black president. That's unheard of. When we talk about what the, the founding fathers would have thought, they would have, they would have laughed at that. They probably would have dropped dead a lot of them if they heard someone say that. But white supremacy still exists. So it okay, doesn't but, matter if we have a woman as a president. It doesn't matter who's in charge or who's doing what. If we still exist within this, if we're still operating under this constitution that is rooted and baked in white supremacy, I don't care what flavor, what you put different color frosting on it, sprinkles on whatever. It's still going to be bad. It's still going to taste bad. It's still going to taste bad. But you're okay. But you're talking about <clears throat> okay. So now taking a, taking in fact time. Over change. So you're talking about something that has been constructed over centuries, and you want one person getting elected to change all of that, and all of a sudden, no, right? no, I, I said, no, one person getting elected will not change all of that. That's my right. point. It, he will not. Right. I didn't say he would. All right, but but, but but because your comment was, well, white supremacy is still here. Okay, yeah, it's going to be. It, it's been here it's for centuries. It's going to be here until we overturn these systems and structures that have been embedded in statutes put in place by the Constitution of the United States. And the yeah. only and the only way to do that is to get more people who look like us into the system to start doing that. It's going to take time. Like like I'm just like it's not going to like this is not like we'll we'll never see it in our lifetime. No, but we can make sure that more and more people get in to where that that like maybe Laura one day when you have a, a son or a daughter look up and goes oh crap it's a lot of it's, it's a lot of people that look like me or that are different in the house of representatives right and maybe by the time you leave this earth and they go okay then they go show their children the same thing this is this is stuff that's going to take generations to change right this is this is a, this is the long game right this is not something that we can sit here and say i want to change tomorrow i want to see no we're not going to see but 
we're not going to see big incremental things. We're going to see small incremental changes. Like I believe that like even when Barack got in place, we did see a difference because it changed the way certain people talked and looked at things. It got it got an entire generation of people who never wanted to get into politics into politics, right? So now we've got that generation. Now you see, I, I believe it led to like the Greta Thornburgs who like young people getting involved, things like that, because they saw it before. So these are these are incremental things that have to take. This is like, I, I look at this and I know it's a long game. Right. So I'm not looking for big changes that happen in my lifetime, but I'm just looking for little things. Right. So we had Barack. Now we got Kamala. We got AOC. We looked at the last house that got not the last. It was two houses ago was the most diverse House of Representatives we had ever seen in the history of this country. You telling me that was going to happen without Barack Obama getting in place? Absolutely not. So I don't agree that we're not seeing change. Change is happening. It's just slow. And it's frustrating because it's not happening at the speed we want to. But again, this is something that was built over centuries. We're talking about the long game, right? This ain't gonna change in 50 years. It ain't gonna change in 75. But it's not gonna change at all if we just if we don't get people in there, if we don't have these conversations and get people involved in the system, then no, it's never gonna change at all. No, and I agree with you. But for example, how do we get people into those systems? When black people vote, right? When we vote. Yeah. But when voting rights get attacked and black people cannot vote, then what happens, right? The same people stay in office or you have uh, white constituents or white constituents putting people in office. And where did that come from? Okay, so then- so The power so, that the Supreme Court has, and now the Supreme Court is doing all of these, that comes from the Constitution, and then now the Supreme Court is rolling back all of these things that would have given us that power to invoke that change. So you, so, so then you- We have to start, I'm just saying, we have to start at the root of it. I Like, I don't think that change is gonna happen overnight. I wanna see America decolonize in my lifetime, probably won't. I do believe that it can, but as you said, it's gonna take a long time and, and going back and forth is not gonna do it. We have to be the change. We have to get out there and do what we can do. But how can we do the best that we can do for people that look like us, people who are oppressed because of who they are, who they love, what they look like? How can we do that in a system that is meant to oppress us, that does not allow us to go that far. It doesn't allow us to go that far. I don't, I disagree. It, it does a lot. Is it, is it hard? Yes. Right. So if, if a law, if a law that we protect gets rolled back, then you say, well, how do you fix it? Then you do the same thing that you, anybody to go get it passed. You go get people together. You understand what it is. You, you, you go do the vote. Like it, it's, this is the, like, that's the burden that you have to carry that a lot of people look at and go, that's too much. I don't want to do it. And I'm like, okay, well then I, it, Next it's, the way, it's the way the system in this country is set up. Right. I, my thing is I, I look at things for how they are. Right. It is what it is. I can't like, if I could change it tomorrow, I would, but I can't, but I can look at where the areas of where I can affect change and go do that. That's why I, me personally, like every single election that comes up, I get involved in the local elections. I understand what's going on. I, I figure out where the representatives are. I talk to them and I say, okay, well, this is the person I'm going to start putting back and down and making sure that people around me understand what they're like. That's how it starts. And that's how we protect those things, right? It, it's, it, it, and it's now more than ever as we're starting to roll back these bigger things that like, I, I probably, if you ask me, I never would have thought Roe versus Wade would ever get overturned. I was like, I don't see that. Like about five years ago. I started seeing the signs. I was like, oh shit, they they really gonna pull this. <laughs> like they they might do this, right? But it's if we don't have enough of us uh, of us involved and in fighting the fight, then yes, it's the system will continue to put more things in place to make it even harder. Like I'm not saying it's not easy. It is a hard road. But there's I I don't see any other logical path. I mean, it could be a civil war, sure, but like we we look at the past civil war, like what did what did the country even really get out of that, right? Like who who wins in that? Nobody. So other other than just saying the system is too corrupt and just leave it, I don't I don't, I don't see another way. Even abolishing the Constitution, you got to work through that same system. So I mean, the answer is everybody quit your jobs. Let's all go into politics. <laughs> I mean that's that's. That's the answer. Me personally, I like making money. So I'm gonna make my money and I'm gonna do my things for my community on the side where I can direct it, where it's not, where it doesn't have to go through that system completely, right? At some point it will. But for the most part, I can I can take the efforts that I want to do and get back to my community and start making that change there directly. 
And that, that's a start. And at some point, it's got to get bigger than that. But, but I mean, the, I, I joke about it, but honestly, like a lot of us do have to get more involved, like, like in politics. And we got to take that hit. And it is, man, you brought up a key point. Like, I will make this example. So I'm in Marietta, Georgia. The, the councilman on the city council here is the one, two, three, fourth generation councilman like his it, it was his dad his grandpa's his great grandpa's before that like this family has sat on the freaking city council board for the last 50 some odd years that's and it's, it's city council they've never gone past that but they also own 80 percent of the land downtown marietta it's it's these type of things right it's is so i yes there there is this lineage and so you you do that by creating it right go go run for for city council do that and then put your son on the board. <laughs> like, that's what they do. Like, do the same thing. Like, we just, it's, it's, the game sucks, but we got to learn how to play it. Because if we don't, they're going to continue to change the rules on the game if we're not there in those conversations. We just, we had a conversation earlier, like, when you're in the room, it's a whole different, the conversation is a whole different when we show up and we're in the room. And it becomes less overt. Maybe sometimes it's more suburb, or maybe sometimes you can actually move the conversation. But when we're not in the room at all, like, then, yeah, I, nothing's going to get done for us. What we're going to get is exactly the same thing we started talking about, the Constitution there. Because when they wrote it, we weren't in the room at all. Again, we didn't exist. You got to be in the room. As hard as it is to get in the room, as pissed off as it makes you when something doesn't work, you got to be in the room. Right? That's why I'm a Stacey Abrams fan. Do I think she's the best candidate? No, but she got to be in the room. We got to get people in the room. I think we, we look too much at like, they got to be this, they got to be perfect that. People knock Obama all the time. I was like, he was in the fucking room. It's a start. He's in the room. Now, they, now, now we know what it looks like. Now we have a visual. You know, people want to attack him. He wasn't black enough. He wasn't this. Enough. Okay. Well, let's go get Leroy from down the street then. Now that we know that, now that we know we can get one in, let's go get Leroy in. Not I'm good with that. Let's go. But gotta be in the room. Otherwise, we just yelling. We just yelling at the ocean, watching it roll by, screaming at it. And the ocean's gonna keep being the ocean. Man, did you want to jump in? Nah, he dropped the mic on that. No, uh, <laughs> I, 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 because I, we did have a discussion earlier, um, and and that was a big part of it is we got to get in the room to to make them think about how they have the conversation, and you can't just be the only one. Like Obama wasn't going to be the 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 savior, the you know the great black savior, right? It was never going to happen. Right. Got him in there, cool. We know what it looks like. Cool. We know what the other side is going to say when we get in the room. We saw that. We saw the rallies that came behind that. Like, so we we we're getting all this information. We're taking in all of this additional information that we didn't even have access to before because we didn't have one in the room. And now that we have one in the room, we need to get two in the room, three in the room, four, five, seven, twelve in the room until there are enough people to actually start affecting change. And unfortunately it's, yeah, it's gonna be decades, centuries <laughs> before it's enough people in the room to overturn, abolish the constitution. Cause I, like I said, it's 80, it's 80% 80 them, 20% everybody else. And it's just gonna be tough for the everybody else to knock down the 80% that are comfortable and happy and actively fighting to keep the everybody else from even taking one step closer. And that is the reality of, of what we live with today. I just want to say as well, you know, not for nothing and going back in history, there have been times throughout history, and it's actually shocking after the civil war, right? Black people were making huge strides in politics and education and so on and so forth. There's there's a, a really famous photo of an all black, all black male, but an all black Congress. Right. And what and what happened? So so I let me just pause right there for a second just to say that there have been times in history where we have been the majority in the room where we put ourselves in there despite, you know, in the face of adversity to be there and to step up to create the change that we want to create. But there was always 
this, stopping us. What was it? White supremacy. Yeah. And then you had the resurgence of the KKK. And I know that this is a kind of a different conversation, but I just bring it up to say that white supremacy, again, is baked into our rule of law. And so it just, I, I do see that the, the change is possible to happen, whether or not we can invoke that change from inside the system. I, I go back and forth with it sometimes. I always, my whole life, I've always said I wanted to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. At one point, I wanted to be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. I'm glad that there's someone before me. But I, I've had, you know, my colleagues and my friends who are abolitionists and stuff that they, they look at me and they're like, how, so you want to leave the plantation, but keep the master's last name. Like, that's how they look at it. They're like, it's the, it's the same thing. Like, the, you can't you can't change the system from within the system. Like, we got to we got to wreck this down and start over. And to your point, David, what does that look like? A lot of people can't answer that question. A lot of my abolitionist friends who say that or talk about decolonization, they can't they can't map that out for me. And I can't map it out myself. So it, it is a larger conversation and it is very, very. Cause, Cause look, when you, when you play it out, right. And, and I, look, I understand the dilemma and, and people, you know, whatever y'all, y'all see this come in the comments, like I'll let you boy, we, we can have a conversation. I think for me, having been, having started my career as the, in part of the system and, and having been in different Intel communities and talking to different people that went to, you know, in the house of representatives and things like that and, and seeing it up close, right. Like the the sheer amount of the, the sheer amount of infrastructure that is sitting on top of what's already been created. I don't think people understand that, right? And and here's how I know people don't understand it: the 2008 2009 financial crisis. Like people still to this day do not understand enough about how this system is set up to realize how close we were to complete annihilation of everything that we know. Right. Like if 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 two or three more like major corporations failed, like it was going to be like like past the Great Depression, like some like we what are we going to do? Right. Like this is what everything's built on top of. So you say, we'll just tear it all down. It's like, OK, but when you when, when you say that, if, if you win and you tear everything all down and nothing, no, nothing, there, there's nothing. We get rid of everything. Like, how are you going to rebuild that? What What are you? The, the the hole of destruction you are going to be in may not even be fixable at that point. Because where are you going to where are you going to rebuild all these things back up? Right? Like it, it's it's different when you actually have to, to run it. Like, okay, you don't like the government, you like some of these things, but there's things like infrastructure, there's things like public utilities, like all these things that that we kind of sometimes I think take for granted, like that comes with it. It's not just a bunch of evil people over there that we're getting rid of. You're getting rid of everything with it. And so I'm like, that that is a like building a country. Let's let's go back in history. You can study Greece, you can study like building a country is not like this ain't a small thing we're talking about here. Like, so it's I get what people I get where the frustration gets and you go, just burn all of it down. Trust me, I get it. There's days I'm just like, man, where's the match? I got it. Let's just <laughs> we out, man. Like, but then you think about everything that 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 has to come with after that. You have to have that then what's next and how do we build this up afterward? And so, you know, I look at it and I, again, I just, this, the system has flaws because it was created by ignorant and short-sighted men. And that's, that's always like to a higher extent, right? Without getting too like religious or spiritual to it, like mankind in general, right? will always, there's all, we're not perfect. There's always going to be a flaw. Right. If you're if you're strategizing, if you're if you're paying chess, you're doing anything, you're always looking for when your opponent makes a mistake. And the mistake exists in the system is that they they gave us a window. It's small. And if you look at it, this is why to Maine's point, they are fighting to keep it there because enough of them realize like, oh, it's a lot of holes we left open. Let's close these bitches before they get there. And that that that's what I'm like. That's my point. I was like, so if it if it wasn't if it wasn't the key to changing it. Why are they fighting so hard to keep it away from us? That's my biggest thing, right? If 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 I'm protecting something that is precious to me, am I gonna put a little security in front of it, or I'm gonna put a bunch of a security in front of it, right? If something's precious to me, am I gonna come at you really hard when you try and get it? I'm gonna be like, oh, okay, it's cool, like you got it, right? Think about it. If we put it in, in monetary terms, if you got if you lose a dollar, you're like, oh man, I lost a dollar. If you lose a thousand dollars, you're like, I lost. like you coming at it. Like you, I want to know, I want this, I want that. It's the same thing. This whole system that we we hate and we say is corrupt, they are fighting awfully hard to keep us from getting in there, right? 
to Maine's point about when Obama got impressed, they, I mean, they went nuts, right? They was like, we got to change everything. We got to do this. And it's like, why y'all so mad though, right? Like, what, what's, what is this? And, and, I, and you, for me, I compare it to like my journey going into the financial game and getting all these, these certifications and, and becoming, understanding more about the financial systems the way they work. I'm like, it's a whole lot of knowledge on this side that they purposely write in a language, the same thing with law, to where it's almost like you have to pass this test to kind of comprehend it and understand it. And then you start understanding like the way they move and the way they talk about certain things. And it's like, man, there's a whole lot of barriers to get here. Why was there so many barriers? Why is it this information just freely available? It's the same thing. I'm going to protect the thing that's most important to me. So yes, you're right. Like you would see times where we would stand up and have ours and then boom, it would come back again because they're like, no, 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 no. We can't let you have all that. And so am I going to sit here and tell everybody it's going to be easy? Nah, we're going to get knocked down. We've seen it already. It's going to happen again. We're going to rise up. We're going to get more of us. They're going to come at us again. But we can't stop. That's that's the biggest thing. Like you have to keep coming. Yeah. And it's and I and I get that it's hard. I think I think all of us have had times where it's just like, man, just I, fuck it. I remember having a conversation with my mom in 2020. I was like, this is the first time I under I I now understand watching everything that happened in 2020, watching all the conversations I had to have with my white colleagues and coworkers and people reaching out to me. Just like I remember talking to my mom. I was like. I now understand why there were certain pictures of Martin and Malcolm and you look at them and they just looked tired. Mm -hmm. And it was a different type of tired. It wasn't like physically, they was just, the weight was just bearing, bearing, you could see it in their face and their emotions when they talked. And I was like, I get it. Right. And I'm not saying I, I, I did anything close to what they did, but it's like, I finally like, it was like, if I'm looking at something, like it kind of finally came into focus and I was like, that's it. This is what it is. Like, so take that, and just these these you know conversations I got to have with these, I'm not gonna say that. Some some were actually really good people that had. They just wanted to go. We, we felt people. it though. We felt what you were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but so so but then imagine somebody like Mandela, right, or MLK, who on this national stage took on everybody' efforts on their shoulders, the weight that they had. So yes, it's the system sucks. It's it's not fair. It's corrupt. They're always going to stand and fight against this. But that's, to me, I look at this as like, this is our, this is our time now to keep fighting back and showing them that no matter what, we are going to be here and keep coming and keep coming. Because if we don't, like they are damn sure making sure that they are locking up every single loophole to where, yeah, if we don't wake up and, and fight back enough, then it, it won't be anyway. They'll, they'll close every single loophole. And at that point, I'm going to Canada, so. Uh, yeah. Y'all be on your own. <laughs> or Australia. I think I like Australia better. I knew you were going to say Australia. Yeah. And to your to your point, um, I love that you brought up, you know, Malcolm and Martin. It's it's so true. Just that 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 you know that exhaustion that you see, just spiritually, mentally, emotionally, all of that just drained, right? Because what and 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 I'm sure you two y'all have felt it. I know I feel it. Like when, as a racial justice educator, when you're going and you're doing the work and you're out there and you're organizing, and then so the Supreme Court just is on one and just decides to start rolling us back to the medieval mess that we used to be in. It's like, well, what am I doing? Why do I care? Why am I fighting so hard? Like, do I get up and fight another day? I know I have to, but like, it's hard. And you brought up Mel and and you brought up Nelson Mandela and. And again, not for nothing, I'm going to say this again, but Nelson Mandela went through what he went through and he raised the nation and he inspired the same way Obama did, right? Because to, to, and again, to your point, when Obama left office and Trump won, the whole entire Trump presidency up until January 6th, which is, of course, another hot button issue right now in the news with all of the trials going on, that was a direct reaction to what Obama was able to do in his, during his terms in office, right? With the change that he invoked in people through education and different things like that, getting all of us to rise up and say, we want more, we want better. Now you see this war on critical race theory where basically learning about Black history is being criminalized in places and, and don't say gay and all of these different things that are happening. But in South Africa, right there, where they had, you know, their system of apartheid, South Africa to this day, and I'm not sure exactly where they rank, but they do rank high. They have one of the best constitutions now, one of the most equal, you know, equal and equitable constitutions that they had to revise. And they went back and started from scratch and whatever they did. But 
they came from a really bad toxic situation and through the change that happened in their country they were able to come up right germany was able to come back up and different countries that have gone through similar things to america with a history of genocide slavery oppression so on and so forth so to me it just blows my mind because america the the, the system of white supremacy in america is just on another level to a point where we don't even want to acknowledge that the constitution is problematic in general. And we went back and forth a little bit, David, but I know that we agree on that, that it's problematic. We live in a society that would rather say that there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? The 80% of the society is just saying, no, nah, it's cool. It's, a, yeah. it's what the whole country is founded on. And it's just, that's tough to overcome, especially in a, in a, a democratic Republic where, you know, essentially your elected officials are you know winners of population you know popularity contests so the peep the people who are most popular are going to have more say so every single time so it's it's just tough it's just going to be a long bumpy winding rocky landmine infested road that we have to <laughs> navigate I, I, it, I mean that's what it is yeah, man. And, and sometimes like you said you know Sometimes you'll you'll get an inch, you'll get two inches, and you'll step on a mine, and you're set back. You know, you'll you're set back. That's the American that's, way. That's the American way. <laughs> that well, really is. This, this like is America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that was that was a hot topic. I mean, Way to come out come out the gate swinging, Laurel. <laughs> come out swinging. Y'all already know what I was going to do. <laughs> I say that humbly, but you know, it's important. All right, folks. Um, main, take us out. You're the best okay. one. Yeah, yeah, I'll take us out. So, seriously, for for this being your first time on the podcast, I'm glad you came out swinging. I'm glad you attacked literally the foundational document of this country. And the reason why I'm glad is because this is this is what the culture actually needs. They need to see people actually look at these foundational documents, look at the systemic situation that African Americans and l- l- literally all minorities in this country have to deal with. Um, what we have to navigate every day in life. Um, the whole, <laughs> honestly, the whole purpose of critical race theory and what that stands for. Um, so I'm glad you came out swinging. I'm glad you attacked the Constitution. Um, I hope I was able to tap dance around it long enough to keep the last 18 months of my career going. But I'm glad you're here with us. I'm glad you're on the on the podcast. And I'm glad you're here in front of the C3 squad. Um, even though David claims that he is the, the best host, there's competition yeah. out here. That was competition in the streets, David. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Before You're not gonna put words in my mouth. I didn't favorite. say best. I said favorite. There's a difference. favorite. Okay, favorite. All right, cool. Favorite. Even There's though David difference. claims he's the favorite. What's the difference between two different words? <laughs> my bad. All right. And, you know, I should know better. I should know better than that. But um, so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've joined us. So uh, C3 Squad, if you're glad that she's here, you're glad that she joined us, please sound off. Look us up. Ebonyascent.com. Hit us up on all the socials. We are at Ascent Ebony on Twitter and at Ebony Ascent on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and then at, uh, what is it, On The Corner Media on TikTok. Hit us up. Look us up. Comment. Engage. Stay on top of us. Pose questions. We're here to bring the hot button topics to you. So hit us up whenever you can. David, you got anything? I forget anything. What's is is my outro top notch? <laughs> you got it, man. You got it. You good. That's all. All great. right. So this has been another episode of the C three podcast. We finally brought the third the third host to you guys. So you're gonna see a lot more of Laurel. She's gonna bring a lot more heat. The next next couple of topics that we hit. So until the next, say say that again. Period. That's on period. Oh, period. So, until the next cocktail, until the next conversation. Y'all stay safe out there, man.